Okay, so hi everyone. Uh, I am uh, Fabrizio Tati, a visiting PhD student in uh, Tudaft. And uh, today we have uh, Gregor Lenz from Sinsense, a startup working in uh, the neuromorphic uh, computing domain. And uh, just as an introduction, I'm uh, going to introduce you to Open Neuromorphic, an organization that uh, me and Gregor and uh, other people are part of. And uh, so what is actually Open Neuromorphic? Well, we are a collective of uh, open source uh, collaborators that uh, span across uh, academia and the uh, industry. Uh, right now, our community is around 280 people, at least in the Discord channel, plus LinkedIn, plus uh, a lot of uh, funny stuff. And uh, we mainly uh, focus right now on software. Uh, among our members, there are uh, many people that write the software that's been heavily used in the neuromorphic domain, like uh, you may have heard of uh, SNN Torch and NORS for uh, spiking neural network string and deployment. Then there are uh, another uh, couple of software frameworks, Tonic and Expelliarmus, written by me and Gregor in this case, for managing event-based data. And uh, during the, uh, Gregor's presentation, we'll know more about these event-based data in the form of event-based cameras. But uh, we are trying also to provide some educational content. Uh, if you visit our website, openneuromorphic.org, you will find a list of webinars, talks, and hands-on sessions with the most used of software tools, with, most, uh, with some of the most uh, famous researchers in the field. And we are trying also to provide tutorials on how to use these tools, on how to have an introduction to this new domain that uh, uh, is, is been increasing in the last years uh, steadily. Moreover, as I said, uh, we still uh, uh, have some events booked that you can find on our website. In particular, uh, we will have at the end of March, Catherine Schumann, talking from the University of Tennessee, uh, talking about uh, evolutionary neuromorphic computing. And uh, that's about it for uh, Open Neuromorphic. Uh, what we would like to do is also to have a platform from your code, meaning that uh, different uh, uh, open source projects are now taking shape in Open Neuromorphic. For instance, here it is not cited, but uh, A-Stream, for direct streaming uh, of frames or of events from event-based cameras to many different uh, computing devices. Uh, to, be, uh, to make an example, I've been involved with Jason Eshragian, the founder, uh, the creator of SNN and Torch on the deployment of, uh, on effi of efficient hardware, uh, on efficient hardware of uh, these new spiking neural networks in uh, collaboration with let's say we're using and targeting AMD Xenix FPGAs. So uh, the speaker of today, as I told you, is Gregor Lenz. He's a neuromorphic uh, engineer at Sinsense, got his PhD from Sorbonne University in Paris, and he focuses on uh, computer vision algorithms and models targeting uh, spiking neural networks for the neuromorphic hardware, which is being developed in, uh, in Sinsense with their uh, uh, custom chips. He is an open sourcer, and uh, he's taught me a lot about open source and coding. And he is the main author behind the Tonic, and one of the main authors behind the uh, Expelliarmus. Uh, so uh, enjoy the talk, and uh, if you have any questions, want to know more about us, uh, please visit our GitHub, Discord, LinkedIn, uh, and website, whatever you want. And uh, we are a pretty active community, and we, we uh, hope that we are able to help you and to get you involved. Now, to Gregor, without breaking the microphone, if possible.
doesn't. Okay, so still a few people. Okay. Um, okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, can they see the screen though? Yeah, it's good. Okay, cool. Fine. <clears throat> so the basic principle of, of neuromorphic computing is we want <clears throat> we look at how biological systems process information and they seem to be doing it extremely efficiently. Um, we want to take inspiration from these biological systems and kind of build from the ground up uh, a, an artificial system on a different substrate. So now we're not, we don't work with biological neurons, but we work with artificial neurons in silicon or your material of choice. Um, so we have this kind of bottom-up approach where rather than, you know, uh, we, we, we start from the very uh, like functional principle of how uh, biological neurons operate at different levels of abstraction. So, uh, you know, they, they spike, they have a memory potential and we, we start from that. We build, uh, we, we build our artificial neurons from that and hope in uh, that by doing that, we, ex we find something, we explore something that's going to compute more efficiently than our current systems. Um, who has ever worked, who knows about event cameras? Who has, has ever worked with event cameras? Who, who has not? Okay, again, a few people. Okay, so um, neuromorphic cameras, event cameras, silicon retinas, can you see them there? Um, are a, a new kind of way of, of uh, visual sensor that is uh, inspired by by how the you know, the biological retina process information, although you know not um, yeah it is inspired by it, and um, there's a couple of advantages and and disadvantages over co over a conventional camera. So so I think most of us are familiar with how a conventional camera records a, a visual scene so at a fixed rate you have these uh, frames that you record maybe some some things in the visual scene are you know moving uh, very fast maybe some are not moving at all doesn't matter you're going to record it redundant data some of it is going to be blurred um, and you know this is what we've been working with uh, mostly the based the field of computer vision is is based on so now if I switch to any, how an event-based camera records that same activity, that same visual scene, um, it's, it's, very, it's based on a very different principle that the, the, each pixel works independently and can now asynch asynchronously process um, information. Um, and what it does is it records a change in illumination. Uh, that means, if the illumination, the amount of photons coming in to this pixel increases by a certain percentage, I will trigger a spike, an event for that certain pixel. So then uh, one of these events or spikes has a time step, X, Y for the pixel location and the polarity meaning light went up or down. So you can see that, you know, when we compare to the, the previous animation, the, the temporal resolution here is much higher, so you can get down to the to a temporal resolution of of microseconds. And what you also see is that for the you know the the parts of the image or the visual scene that doesn't uh, do anything, we don't have to record any new data, right? So what that gives you is the camera is now directly linked to activity in the visual scene. If there is no new activity, if you just film a static scene. You don't record anything. You don't get any output of the of the camera, uh, which hopefully then we can also you know make use of in a in the processing step where we don't have to burn any power. Um, yeah, another advantage is because of the high re temporal resolution is that we have like we can track very fast motion as well. Typically, though, the spatial resolution of these cameras is much lower. Okay. Yeah, so then um, also just showing you here 
a uh, little video of uh, that compares for face detection algorithms. So you see on the top left, you see uh, an event camera output. On the other ones are rendered frames from, you know, kind of image-like. But you see that if the person stands still, we, you know, you don't get any signal from it. And uh, so only when they move, you actually get to, you know, get any output from this from this camera. Uh, and in this case, in, for this algorithm, we actually use the, the eye blinks um, because, you know, even if a person stands still, he will, he will still blink uh, to detect kind of like eyes and therefore the presence of a face. And then we compared like power consumption uh, to some other algorithms. That's just to show you bits of how this data looks like. So I, am, I work at uh, Sinsense, which is um, now a hundred person uh, company, so not small anymore. We are located in um, start of a spin-off in Zurich uh, from the Institute of Neuroinformatics, but are now also have locations in in China, uh, in Shanghai, Chengdu, and uh, we focus on ultra low power inference for on neuromorphic hardware. So we try to identify these applications that you know, um, are on the edge, are typically battery powered, need to be, um, yeah, need to consume very little power. So we can, we can work with different input signals. They can be your audio, can be your vision data, can be your uh, biomedical systems, like heart rate or whatnot. Again, the, the, the most important fact, again, I guess, is, is, the, is, the, is the power consumption, but we also want to have a, a low latency because we, yeah, we don't want to uh, send these uh, things to, to a cloud instance, right? Um, yeah, okay. We have two hardware families. So there's, on the left-hand side, you see the, the vision family with the Dynapse CNN, which is a, a convolutional neural um, spiking, convolutional spiking neural network accelerator, uh, digital asynchronous, and when combined with an event camera, so you know an event camera like that outputs data like I just showed you earlier, then we have our chip uh, called SPEC. This is roughly one square centimeter form factor, so um, you know you can get this on your um, drone in your in your on your robot in your toy or whatnot um, and we are now starting to sell these you can get these from um, you, you can you can buy these now so this is one of the first commercially available um, hardware that you you can buy and you know play with and the second family is that we with the building or we have is is called silo this is a digital synchronous and focus on low power uh, sorry lower dimensional signals but also low power and is targeted for example for audio processing biomedical signals I will, I mean, I, I work in uh, the algorithms team of, of Synthesis where we explore, you know, applications and also go outside of the limitations of the chip to see, to kind of like steer uh, the development of the, of the hardware. And I, I specifically work on the vision team, so I will focus today on, on, on the vision part. So this here is um, how, you know, the kind of pipeline on on spec on the vision chip so you so you get uh, like output from from the event camera uh, which maybe you want to downsample and then you uh, have one there's nine uh, cores nine neuromorphic cores on this on this chip each core has a combination of uh, a convolutional architecture uh, connectivity spike as um, a spike you know, spiking neuron and the pooling layer. And then you have nine of these cores, different kind of memory sizes uh, to each, and then you can quite flexibly deploy your ne networks on it. And then there's also some post-processing um, accumulation layer for, for predictions if you want. 
the it uses a completely asynchronous uh, routing fabric so you you know also how you um you will be able to like kind of uh, communicate with each of these codes there's you can have uh, recurrent architectures if you wanted so so you can flexibly uh, connect also in between these these cores and um yeah i think that's that's about Sinsense. Um, any questions so far? So the next um, point that I want to talk about is about is a bit more about the, the data, and specifically since I know some few um, you know students who might want to work with this, but uh, the cameras are not freely you know and it easily to come by you know if you don't happen to have um you know one of these still relatively expensive cameras how do you get um your hands on a data set if you want to start exploring so one one framework that uh, fabrizio mentioned that you know uh, i i'm i mean i mainly wrote is is called tonic where if you wanted to start exploring algorithms and work with event-based data then if you will have typically, you know, um, you you can get like different kinds of data sets in there. So you will have your typical visual event stream classification is kind of like your image classification, right? But it's, I mean, it's really a video. So where um, you have your audio uh, classification, if you want, if you're working on more complex tasks, you can, you have data sets for visual odometry, SLAM, if you're interested in navigation. So there's that as well. So do check that out. And the second part that this framework does is about transformation. So you what, what you get from these cameras is a list of, you know, one sample or let's say, yeah, one recording is a list of events. I told you it's this tuple of TXY polarity. And normally this is, you know, if you are going to use any modern deep learning framework, then you will not be able to directly feed the, the events um, to it um, because, so you would first need to kind of change representation of these events. And, you know, the most straightforward one is to just create a frame out of, this, of these events, just bin events, and, and kind of uh, make uh, uh, rasters uh, or frames at a certain uh, time width of, of, the, of them. And then you can feed it much like your, your classical video. So what this um, frame library also gives you is you can kind of generate different kinds of representations from these events that makes it, make, makes, makes it easier to process them on, you know, your, your, with your deep learning libraries. If you, uh, want to use those and then there's also a bunch of augmentations if you're interested in that as, uh, as well okay then i there's another thing that i just want to mention is about compression so even though you might think that uh, an event camera already outputs very efficient um, like the output is already you know very um, efficient because you only output, you only record changes in the data, right? But because of the microsecond uh, res temporal resolution, if you move this camera, let's say on a car or on a drone, then you actually get very high data rate. And so even, so for example, now that there is bigger data sets released, like even for such a automotive, for example, data set that's just really below 40 hours of recording, um, you already get like 3.5 terabytes in size. So maybe, you know, so Fabrizio and me looked a bit into how can we efficiently encode events where we make use of the structure of the data and um, basically choose a good compression that's still fast to read. Because obviously, so we want to have a good trade-off between file size and also the time it takes to read a file, to read the data, because you want to feed data to your machine learning algorithm as fast as possible. So what 
this figure shows here is on the x-axis, you have the reading time for a certain file format. And on the y-axis, you have the, the file size. Um, and ideally, you want to be close to the origin where you read fast and compression is high. Uh, and then you have you know, your standard format of some NumPy, which are up here, which uh, are just very large in size. And then, for example, uh, this library that mainly uh, Fabrizio wrote, Expelliarmus, uh, can generate these formats, can deal with these formats that, that are here in blue, um, formats that have been proposed by Prophecy, and which gives you a really good trade-off. So, you know, um, if you struggle with working with terabyte of data, then uh, also check that one out. Okay, so where are we so far? So for the, when it comes to the data, so if one of you was to be interested in, in, in exploring this, uh, there is this public data sets available. Uh, you now can read from a efficient, you know, in an efficient format. You can apply the transformations automatically that, uh, so that you can feed it to your algorithm. And I just put here, I copied from the um, from documentation, a uh, bunch of lines, a couple of lines here that let you do all that in a couple of lines of Python that downloads the data. So here's the transform, uh, which pins the, frame, uh, the events to frames. Here's the data set, which downloads it for you automatically. And then, you know, you just choose your batch size and, and um, you know, glue them together, the individual samples. So, yeah, so that was the easy part. Okay. Um, any questions so far? Yep. So when we say same length of recording, I, I guess same hours of, of uh, recording of the property. So it depends obviously on your, um, the scene of recording. So now in contrast to if you work with a conventional camera, you will, as we said, at a certain pace, certain frequency sample your, your visual scene. But now with the event-based camera, it depends on what you're recording. If you record your, your garage door and where nothing happens, um, then you will also not have any output data. But then if you stick this thing on a drone and fly with very high speeds, then you will generate a lot of events. Um, so the answer is it will really depend on what you're recording and of course also the spatial size of the sensor which you know multiplies the data rate uh, exponentially so um but typically still let's say for moderate uh, if you just wave your hand in front of it for some moderate action it will be probably um and you have like a small spatial size so let's say 128 by 128 and the data rate will be lower for the latest prophecy cameras that go um, uh, have high definition HD resolution, it will be much higher actually. Okay, uh, and then, yeah. So sorry, uh, can you can you repeat it? Sorry. So no, you record each individual pixel is really independent, and uh, there's you know there is a uh, um, a limit in terms of bandwidth that you can have. So from so I get all these events from these pixels. They say okay, now my illumination changed, and then you still have to process all these signals. And so if you really let's say where to shake this event camera with very high speeds, it might be that it swarms. The, the chip uh, and so you have like an upper bandwidth an upper limit of events that you can can have yeah yeah does it answer your question okay 
Okay. So, is there something? Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Gregor. How do you define the latency? Is it the time step, the input to output, or the input to correct prediction, or something else? Because 200 milliseconds does not seem so low. I guess it depends on the app. Okay, so this refers to, so here, um, someone, Lias, in this case, is um, referring to um, what I, when I said 200 milliseconds, we're targeting 200 milliseconds latency applications. So this depends on, on the application. Uh, normally, we say time to prediction. Um, if, you know, the thing is that if you use then bigger networks, so let's say for a vision application, you use bigger networks, then obviously also, you know, your latency will, will increase. So I guess the answer is uh, time to prediction for most, for most cases. Okay. Uh, second, second part uh, of, of, you know, what I want to chat about is about training, training models on this kind of data. Okay. So now we looked a bit in how this data can look like and um, so why not bin these, you know, event data to, to like frames and just process it with the CNN, right? I mean, it's, it's much easier. Um, the problem with that is, as we saw, when you don't have, you, you don't move the camera, or you don't move anything in front of the camera, then you don't get any output from this camera. So then if you decide, I want to bin X amount of events, if you don't get any new signal, then you then you might have to wait a longer time until this like accumulates enough signal accumulates, so that leads to a problem of higher latency. Even though maybe you would be able to to you know classify you know gestures or something like that, or if there's a person um, present or not, um, just purely based um, processing throwing a CNN on onto um, binned frames from from such event data. Is, is likely going to uh, lead to a high latency to a prediction. Um, so we want to make use of spatial, so sparsity in this data. So what, what do I mean by that? So we have, we have the spatial uh, sparsity. So you saw that the parts of the image that are not moving don't record anything. And we have the temporal sparsity where also if I, you know, I stop uh, if I stop moving, then also the signal, you know, disappears, the output disappears. So if that also tells you that we need in the network, in the model, we need some kind of memory, right? Because I still, if I stop moving, you know, the, the, the object detection st should still pick me up, right? Should still say that, you know, I'm still there. So what what we work with in order to make use of the sparsity and to have memory is is called um, spiking neural networks. So what are spiking neural networks? They are essentially a, a specialized case of um, recurrent networks, current neural networks, with very high output quantization. So one bit, well, so yeah. Uh, high quantization means is single bit quantization. So your output is either one or zero. Uh, hence the spike, right? If I output the one, then uh, you, yeah, we spike. The idea is that if if um, I will only I will only have the neurons of my network spike and output something if I also get output from the event camera. And other than that, I will just not process anything. So typically, my, my network will use some kind of asynchronous logic where I only have to power you know, stuff up if I really need. Some things that we are not interested in at uh, symptoms or you know, we, is not our priority is, is uh, very intricate neural models, very complex models. So we really start from the, the from like a, we have a bottom up approach where we start we take the simplest neural model and see how far does it get us um, you know if it gets us 90 percent of the way um, by using very little power then that's great and we also have a focus on training speed and robustness because we need to iterate fast and at the end of the day we develop stuff for real life applications so they should work 
So here's like how such a neuron model looks like. So this here is a leaky integrate and fire neuron. So on, on this left column here, so the left row, sorry, the upper row is input current to a neuron. This is a constant current in this case, but um, you know, if you work with an event camera input, then probably this, this will be single events over time. But here it is to show that the, this thing has a certain kind of uh, um, memory, I guess. And also, uh, if so, if you increase this current, then because your your membrane potential, so now you will integrate this current over time, and your membrane potential also leaks away over time with a certain time constant. And if you you know only uh, feed so much input, then you will stay under beneath a certain threshold, and you will kind of go to a resting state here. But if you feed enough current and you can, you know, it's the same case if you have just like single events here that are high, high enough uh, of, of currents, then you will see that the membrane potential goes up until a certain level, which in this case is a, a membrane threshold. It will uh, spike, it will emit a spike as neuron and then reset in this case to zero. And because the current here is constant, uh, it will just repeat this over time here. So when training as when training spiking neural networks, we at uh, at Sinsense, we focus on on gradient based optimization. You know, there's a whole uh, because neuromorphic engineering is trying to be uh, is trying to take inspiration from biology and backdrop is uh, per se is, is 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 not biologically plausible. Then uh, you have like a large variation of how you train these networks, the different kind of learning rules, biologically inspired learning rules. We focus on, you know, we kind of fo focus on what what gets us the best results. So we just use backpropagation through time. How you would also train a recurrent neural network. You have to kind of use some tricks because the the output is is quantized very heavily. So you, you have to kind of use some surrogate signals, but um, nevertheless, this leads, you know, back propagation through time leads to relatively good results, but it obviously scales. So now you work with time, right? So, and you have to unroll the network over time and like back propping over through all these time steps is quite, quite lengthy. So it's, scales badly with in terms of memory and, and computation complexity. Um, for the architectures I already said, like we, we, we focus on, on very simple neural models. And um, in this case, we just start for the vision parts. We start with integrating fire neurons. Uh, these don't even have a leak. So, you know, it's also limited biologically uh, plausible. And um, the, the, the advantage of this is that we have, it's very power efficient to execute this on, on the hardware. You only update neuron states when you get new data. Uh, there is no like, you know, frequent um, bias that you need to feed this. You, need, you don't need to update the neuron states. Um, so this is very power efficient, but maybe for some uh, applications, if you don't have any leak, if you don't forget any of your signals, maybe it's not maybe it's not what you want. However, it seems to work for a lot of uh, applications. And then this here is something that I am I'm going to go into more detail. So this here is um, about the discrepancy between training the network on a synchronous, you know, on your, on your computer on with a GPU that works in a discretized uh, time that works um, yeah, with, with synchronous hardware, but then processing it on asynchronous hardware. And this leads to a discrepancy. Um, so why, why is that the case? Um, can you just ask how, how much, how long do I have actually? Still, oh, okay. Well, I'm not gonna go that long, but okay. Um, so on the left-hand side, we have, we have here the input current. So we have here three spikes. So let's say these are three weighted spikes, okay, that I receive over time. And let's say this here is over continuous time. So on, on, my, on my chip, uh, which uh, processes stuff asynchronously, 
and in this case doesn't know time, it would just do a cumulative sum of, of this, it would just integrate this. And as I said, uh, on, on the spec chip, we don't have any leak, so infinite memory. So you just have to update here once, uh, update, and then the second spike arrives and it pushes it over above the threshold. So it emits the spike and goes to zero. And then we have the third spike and it, uh, you know, the memory potential is, is, is quite negative then. Fine. But the thing is that uh, when we train the network, we have to, when, when I talked about this, like changing the representation of, of events. So you have to, we, we, we discretize time uh, of the events in order to bind them to, to frames that are quite sparse so that we can process them on the GPU. Um, but then you kind of, you know, let's say if this is, you know, 100 microseconds or something like that, then you normally, you will just, because of your discretized time, you will then, let's say, have only two time steps here. So then in simulation, when you train the network, you get this first stack, you integrate it, and then the second one, you know, the inputs cancel each other out. So then you end up with no spike and the positive membrane potential. So um, from this, I guess, simple example, you can see that when we train here our networks on, in simulation on a on GPU in discretized um, with data that is disc discretized in time, then you know maybe we get good accuracy, looks nice, you know, um, and but then when we deploy on the chip, there is no such uh, thing um, as a as a convolutional kernel that is applied uh, at once. All of the events are processed individually, so uh, that means that. Uh, the order of the events all of a sudden can make a big difference in in the outcome of, of the signal, okay? So yeah, this, this discrepancy between the, the, the clock commutation time discretized on, on our GPUs, on our, on our computers, and the event-based computation on our neuromorphic hardware. And this is really a major, you know, difficulty that uh, we, we try to address when, when training networks for, for neuromorphic uh, hardware, in our case, asynchronous digital. So um, how do we tackle that? I guess for one you know, um, straightforward solution is to just like have finer grain temporal resolution, but then you increase the time steps, again, increases the complexity of BPT or, you know, computation you need to do, memory you need to keep, um, so uh, is expensive. Then we can reduce uh, weight to threshold ra ratios. So let's say if you know these weighted spikes here were not that large, but maybe a bit uh, slower than uh, lower, then um, you would kind of need more of these spikes in order to push uh, the member potential above the threshold. And then um, you can, uh, like can get away with maybe some sometimes these spikes cancel each other out or so. So if you have like let's say more spikes that uh, have like less magnitude, um, then um, this will also help with this problem. You can obviously then also try to spread out the spiking activity over time so that it's not you know that the tr the chip is not like swamped with like uh, like a transient response of events and. Um, when we talk about, especially for our chip, the, 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 the spec chip, uh, we have this convolutional connectivity and on, on the GPU, well, you, you apply the convolution, you calculate the, comp uh, the convolution in one go as a matrix multiplication, but then here on the chip, it's actually single events in your receptive field that are integrated over time uh, and summed up. And um, so if you have in simulation, a lot of these things, you know, at the same time, um, so like a high activation uh, for one time step, then again, this is exactly this problem where in, in simulation, we, we treat it all in one time step, but then on chip, all these things have to be uh, treated. The convolution has to be done uh, sequentially and that leads to differences. Then we also have, um, so in contrast to your uh, conventional camera, we deal with like a different kind of noise. So <clears throat> um, 
for example, because the 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 pixels can you know have these they can output the events with microsecond resolution. Uh, if you point these things at the fluorescent lamp like these ones here, you will actually be able to to see to pick up like a like a hundred hertz flicker or whatever they they're using. And uh, so even though you think you're recording a static scene, you might actually not. So that's that can create issues where for you know real life applications, all of a sudden you have to think about okay, what kind of uh, you know, mains frequency are these people using? What, what um, we have to kind of filter that out so that we don't again swamp our chip with events uh, that are you know useless for processing. Um, I guess a simple solution for that is is to have some kind of low pass filter on 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 each pixel. Another um, problem is is about hot pixels, which means that you know, in in some way they they get stuck. So so sometimes, um, the, even though there is no signal change, they will still fire and uh, might you know cause an issue for your network that leads to wrong predictions. Uh, one other thing that I wanna wanna mention is is about monitoring when when training SNN. So in contrast to <clears throat> your your you know, conventional uh, ANN, where you know the magnitude of the intermediate layers is probably not that crucial. We, it's very important for to to actually double check and monitor the the, the output of these intermediate layers because you want to know at every time point how many spikes there are in the network. So, for example, one so one thing uh, that you could log is firing rates. So firing rate is uh, if you have you know over so many time steps in uh, one layer um, so on, on the how, how many what's the percentage uh, over like the average percentage of, of neurons firing so here what we can see is this, these are two different logs here we have training as it progresses over time so these are training steps <clears throat> and this here is the firing rate for a certain layer and you know it looks you know, it looks okay. So this mean what this means is like on average, neurons in this layer for this sample fired so six percent of the neurons fired across the whole sample. But then uh, what I want to stress here is that um, you should look actually at activities per neuron because sometimes the firing rate looks okay. So six anything around you know five percent or whatever is fine. Um, but then when you then plot it in a different way, so you then look at the firing rates uh, for each or the histogram of firing rates for, the, for that um, layer. So what we then have here is on the X axis now we have the firing rates. We have, you know, going this axis, we, we, we have the training as it progresses over time. And then what we see is that, you know, there's most of the neurons fire very little. I mean, rough, maybe the 6% or something like that. And uh, but there are some neurons that fire at 220 percent. So then you know you get these kind of issues where you have to then go hunt for for why is there such a difference on when you you know it, everything looks good in simulation you deploy it on a chip and then it you know maybe one neuron hogs all the information hogs all the activity so like um, that creates issues as well. Uh, another thing that you need to keep in mind is is you know if we do because our our chip works with eight bit weights, so when we when we have very long tail parameter distributions, we like that obviously is um, is, is bad for quantization performance. So we also want to avoid that. Um, another focus of of ours, as I said, is about fast iteration so we we want to be able to explore you know run many experiments quickly so and and bptt as i said you know is relatively slow so what we <clears throat> what we worked on is an algorithm called exodus where we uh is, is essentially an efficient implementation of bptt on the gpu and if i um 
I have you focus here on the on the right column. So we have your normalized training um, time for BBTT for one, and then you see our algorithm here, uh, which is an improvement over an existing algorithm, which gets like an order of magnitude uh, speed up. Uh, and then because this this algorithm already uh, existed but dropped like you know. Um, a certain part of the neuron equation so that it was not calculating uh, the gradients correctly, um, which was still fine for most applications, but we uh, corrected that so that our algorithm is really now faster and, and completely equivalent to what BPTD does. So you get like a nice, you know, validation accuracies here um, while being at the same time much faster. Um, one more, yeah, another thing how we speed up the training is, for example, uh, that, so now we can not only look at the, the backprop, uh, optimizing backprop, but also the data loading. So um, because what, what I said in the beginning about you have to apply these transformations of events, so you, 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 know, you generate these frames. And uh, if you do that for every, which are deterministic transforms at the end of the day, if you do that for every step, for every epoch, this is going to cost you a lot of time during training. So you can be a bit smarter um, by using some form of intermediate caching. So meaning you save some intermediate results either on disk or on memory, in memory, and then just retrieve these transformed samples rather than um, you know, the original events and then have to uh, push them through this data loading pipeline every for every epoch. So here on the left hand side, we just see just loading the data every time from from scratch. So we go events, frames, and then load it to the um, to the model. And here we have a, a normal BPTT implementation. In this case framework is called Synapse. And then you can see that our algorithm Exodus already helps to speed up the computation. That's good, but uh, still the GPU is idle most of the time. So then we can, um, like, um, we can cache intermediate results by you know applying these transforms once and then saving the intermediate results for just for the data, right? That's before we feed it to the model. And then we can really keep the GPU occupied by just keeping feeding it data. So you can see here, so I should have mentioned here that on the y axis is the, is the training time per epoch. Um, you know, the absolute magnitude here doesn't matter so much, but more like the relative um, magnitudes here. So that uh, you can see that, you know, with Exodus, we can go really super fast and then even faster when we just put all the events that are already in efficient format directly on the GPU. And um, so you can go from originally somewhat two minutes to I think that's something like nine seconds, eight seconds per epoch. So, you, you know, by, by identifying these bottlenecks, you can, you know, you can speed up uh, a lot. So yeah, it's just practical steps. I mean, I guess most of you will be familiar with that already, but uh, I mean, just from my experience, like I, you know, if you invest in times, the time in, in the right tools um, to help you do your automated logging, to, to help you to speed up um, or scale up experiments to multiple devices, nodes, whatever, um, I think that definitely, you know, pays off, get your, your tools right. Understand your data, always, always visualize your data, right? So if you, um, you know, you want to use some, I don't know, augmentations, or you know, even without that, you you always want to make sure that you understand what you're actually uh, feeding to your model. Um, then, like we do, you know, in my team, we start with a simple model, see how where does it get us, um, and only then increase the complexity gradually if we have to. Um, one thing about SNNs is that they typically um, have very high variance. They're very sensitive to, to initialization because of the high quantization in the, in the intermediate layers. So um, if you run your experiment and you get a certain performance and then you just choose a different random seed and all of a sudden your performance uh, drops by you know, three to 5%, um, you know, that's, that's not good. So 
in order to understand better how how well your your model actually performs, how stable it is, um, you you should you know run with multiple random seeds and, and such things. Uh, yeah, monitoring in of these intermediate layers, it's really it's crucial for when you train SNNs because to really target, to, especially if you want to deploy on on a certain piece of hardware, then you need to make sure that you also capture the constraints of the hardware and that you can then work during training work towards that. And yeah, and then identify training uh, bottlenecks, what, what's actually, you know, uh, it's always good to do benchmarking, what's actually the, um, causing the most, like slow, slowing down your, your overall training. And yeah, any, any questions so far? Yep. Yeah, and slides with the events. Is this one? Yes. How do you decide which spike carries information and you can drop it? I.e. the event-based input, you have three and you end up with one. Uh -huh. So how can you, how do you, um, well, so the question is, um, how how do I identify the spikes that have meaning and which which don't? So luckily, I I don't have to decide that, right? I mean, by in su in a supervised setting, by showing it, you know, a certain target, certain um, you know um, training it towards training it in a supervised fashion will hopefully take care of that. Um, Obviously, you want to guide the network in using only a certain amount of spikes or um, spreading them out over time so that you don't hit these bandwidth limits of the chip. But there is no manual. I mean, you can have, let's say, maybe in the, in the beginning of the network, you can have a simple downsampling layer or um, we, we, some, we sometimes do that where we just like cut maybe 50% of the events for for scenarios where there's like a lot of movement. So apart from these manual filters in the beginning, you know, you let the black magic that is deep learning do the work, I guess. Uh, is there another question? Okay. So yeah, I just also here, I'm, I'm almost uh, at, at the end actually. So um, I just wanted to show also again just a few lines of code how how easy it is to deploy stuff on onto our chip. So we really you know invested time uh, into these engineering efforts to build the tools so that you can um, you know deploy on, onto on easy in an easy manner. So here you you define your network as you would as you would do normally, in this case, Synapse, uh, our framework is, is building on PyTorch. And, and you have, rather than your, your, your ReLU layer, maybe you would have here what's called an integrate and fire layer. And, uh, and then you can train this thing in whatever fashion you would like. And by converting it in a um, to, to this compatible network, which will regroup the layers. You can just, um, like you would call two CUDA, you could just call two spec to B, and then can start feeding in events and already read out um, predictions, you know. So the, the hope is here really that, you know, it's easy for people to, to get going with this. And I have demo videos, but on my laptop, so, I'm not sure if this is going to work because <laughs> I have to switch, I think. I think this, this is probably they're not going to be visible on your thing, right? Oh, nice. Okay. Um, Yeah, okay, so you're saying that I, I should join here and then share my screen? Yes. Okay, cool. Uh -huh. 
just have to connect to the network here. So I'm gonna join uh, the Zoom call as well because we're live streaming so that I can share my screen so that uh, participants can also see the videos hopefully. Or we just, yeah, we can also do that. Okay. In the meantime, any does anyone have any questions? You want to know? Yep. <laughs> yeah. So there, good question. So there's different approaches to it. So you can. Um, so first of all, you could uh, filter the the um, the frequencies before you have you know, before you actually arrive on the sensor level and then maybe, you know, have like a three channel event camera. Um, so that's possible. And that I think actually also exists. Um, but the thing is that we use the event camera for kind of like machine vision tasks. So um, it's, you know, it's not for the applications that we've targeted so far, it's not necessary simply. Uh, yeah, it's it's an interesting point indeed. Yeah, so that yeah uh, that also exists. So, um, so for example, there's there's one camera that combines a regular frame based or you know regular frame capturing with capturing the event changes in between. So you kind of try to get both the best of both worlds where you still have these like gray level, uh, absolute light intensity frames, which you know you can process very easily. But then if you want to track some high speed motion, you can use the events um, uh, to, do, to do some processing in between. Yeah. So uh, interestingly enough, you can end up with dropping a high percentage of the signal and still, you know, have very good predictions. Um, simply, um, yeah. So I guess um, one thing is choosing this cutoff frequency. Okay. Uh, then again, this depends on the speed and so on. Um, but I guess, um, yeah, I guess one one thing is that you can end, you can totally rely on uh, a very narrow actually amount of the of the events uh, to actually get a, a word like a signal that you you need. Yeah. Does this answer your question or? Uh, yeah. The dev kit, yeah. So uh, a dev kit uh, like this one here will set you back uh, 4K. Well, and so this is um, this is a, a, a development kit that has you know um, which has the, the motherboard, daughterboard, and and the chip. Um, you know, it's, yeah, I guess for development purposes. But th there's also smaller form factor versions available. That's what I want to say. Um, where um, if you wanted to have this on a drone. Uh, um, yes, correct. Yes, yes. Uh, it's, I, I don't know. I would have to get back to you on this one. Uh, but it's roughly going to be the same. Price range, yeah. Oh, where are we? Yeah. So you mean that I put the videos on here and then? Okay, okay, gotcha. Yeah, it doesn't work, right? Okay, no problem.
So data labeling is definitely difficult when, when you have spikes. So let's say you have an object recognition task and then, um, you know, ideally you would label every event where, you know, where, where it belongs to, but that's, that's likely unfeasible. So what, um, I mean, how it's done uh, typically is that you will use some kind of algorithm to create normal frames from that. And then with some kind of high frequency, hopefully something like I don't know, 60 Hertz or something like that, uh, you will label these frames and then transform back the, 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 the labels uh, onto the event stream. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna get this one and which one? Four, seven, eight. There's been ages that I've used uh, use PK. <laughs> <laughs> okay, cool. This one here. If you have any more questions, then just ask. Mm -hmm. This is start for you. Right. Ah, now I need to go back, right? I need to go. Okay, we're getting there. So this is an optical flow demo. So um, where um, I think green is ground truth. Yeah, looks like it. And um, you know we have like a lower dimensional flow prediction. Um, yeah. Okay, nice. And then can I also play another one? Oh, this is like a fall detection demo where like, uh, so, so for example, this one targets like smart home applications. You know, if, if someone, you can have this like a, <laughs> uh -huh. did, you, did you can see it? Yes. Oh, I see. Does it work? Cool, nice. So you can see uh, our colleague who is uh, <laughs> falling down a lot. <laughs> okay. What else? There's another one which like follows, um, you know, a person. This is about yeah, detecting where the person is and then just following. As, as they go and this yeah you can see this is run on on chip and does and interestingly here it does this kind of like saccadic motion right like uh like uh, we do with our eyes uh i think that's yeah that's that's what i have cool so if i go back to chrome Oh, okay, nice, you can see, that's good. So um, as a conclusion, yeah. So events, you know, are this new data format, where they are different from images, even though maybe with today's architectures, we treat them as such sometimes. Um, we have these uh, challenges when we deploy to real life applications that deal with different kinds of noises. We have to, 
um, you know, make sure that we uh, stay within the limits of what, what our hardware can do. If we target these edge, edge applications, obviously power is, is, is a serious constraint. We have this asynchronous computing paradigm, which is, you know, has its own challenges, which is relatively, you know, which we, we need to deal with. And we certainly need to the, the full pipeline. So um, when I said also like uh, about in the beginning of the training, why not just use your, your classical um, edge GPU and uh, just like try to do it like that, right? So if they're, they're already very low power if you do your pruning and your quantization. So in order for neuromorphic to really show a benefit to, to in, in applications, uh, ideally that's above, you know, a factor of, of 10 improvement on some scale, then you really need to have this full pipeline of sensors, algorithms, and hardware, where um, you, um, if you choose just one or two of those, it's likely that you're not going to get this um, better performance uh, than a conventional system. And that's it. Uh, thanks a lot for, for listening uh, today. My name is Gregor Lenz. You can find like, um, you know, um, my social media and whatnot on my web page. Also next talks uh, in one month, there's gonna be another open neuromorphic talk online uh, with a hands-on session on, on, on spec and, and synapse. And I'm also gonna be at a, at the neuromorphic workshop in in Colorado, in the US in in June, in July, in for a topic proposal about open source neuromorphic hardware, software, and wetware. There's applications open um, recently if you want to apply for that workshop as well. Uh, it would be great to see you there. And uh, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So there's a couple more questions on the chat. Um, so someone who already asked a question uh, said, says that in neurobiology, we don't yet know what is data and what is not data. Could we use Scylla to classify in real time? So if you're talking about things like spike sorting, um, then you know um, that definitely would be, you know, um, feasible. I guess uh, at the moment it's more like um, I guess there's more like an algorithmic challenge uh, uh, for for to understand actually the importance or like you know it's, uh, biological spikes and what what they do. Does the power estimation under 10 millivolt consider only the spiking power or it rather considers all the peripheries? So this is about, um, you know, what the chip burns uh, overall. So I mean, I, I'm not sure what, what um, they mean by the peripheries, but uh, yeah, so this is about our, our chip. So, I mean, obviously if you wanna, you know, you will get the prediction from this chip and then do something with it, but uh, it doesn't include that. Um, it does include the camera though. Yeah. What is the what is the effort to directly combine silo with analog sensors, which transduce spiking biological signals directly from nervous tissue? So we we are not working in in this space, although personally, I think, you know, is very, very interesting to, so to basically have um, like spiking systems that are implanted, you know, maybe in your motor cortex where you do, um, you know, local processing before you then uh, send it to, to another, you know, uh, downstream processing downstream system. So I think I'm pretty convinced that there's gonna be applications in this. There is groups looking into that. Uh, again, currently it's more like an algorithmic challenge, but it's not so much about, okay, we need to reduce the power consumptions for these applications to work.
Okay, I think that's it. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, Fabrizio is going to say something. Okay, uh, thanks, Gregor, for uh, the talk. And it was really interesting, as expected. And uh, yeah, uh, just in conclusion, uh, we would like to point out, as I already did in the chat, that the talk has been recorded, as it uh, it been uh, advertised at the beginning, and um, that will be put on YouTube. And I would like to thank Tia Delft for providing us the facilities uh, and the opportunity to host this talk in this university. Uh, also would like uh, the IAI <clears throat> MCS uh, department uh, for assisting us and Professor Charlotte Frangel for uh, organizing this talk. And uh, that's it. Thanks, Gregor, uh, for joining us. And uh, we will upload the talk as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you.